Hello, I'm uh, Chris Leishman, Professor of Housing Economics at the University of Adelaide. And I've been involved in Duncan's um, More Different Futures Network for the last few weeks, running the odd breakout session and uh, produced a video a few weeks ago focusing on housing supply issues. And I think it's fantastic that we've now got this opportunity to make uh, some Australian-Canadian comparisons as well. So Duncan's asked me to think about these comparisons through an Australian lens, uh, although clearly um, I'm also a UK housing researcher in, in that capacity. But I think what I want to do is concentrate on three main um, areas. And these are the supply of housing in a general sense, um, the supply of new built housing, more specifically, and then thirdly, uh, how different things might look after the COVID-19 crisis uh, comes to an end, if indeed it, if it does ever end. So several previous video commentators have actually noted that new build supply is actually only one component of housing supply overall. Steve Pomeroy made this point, for example, in, in his, one of his recent videos. We tend to lose sight of that fact quite easily because usually there's a strong policy focus on new build housing supply and then you know, a related debate about planning controls, development permits, and then the operation of land markets as well. Of course, all of these things remain important, um, but in Australia, the private rental sector can be seen as something uh, um, of a ticking time bomb at the moment for a number of reasons, including very heavy reliance on private investors or so-called mom and dad landlords. And uh, a range of policy settings here uh, have actually encouraged the growth of that sector and there are worries now about how overextended or leveraged some of these might be. So when we factor in job losses potentially impacting on investors, uh, investor households, as well as tenant households, um, then there may be some serious overlap and, and cause for concern. So Gavin Woods actually referred to this issue in his video a few weeks ago. Um, and you know, in Australia, the rental sector is heavily associated with students, um, adult children, and recent migrants. And all of those groups have been particularly hard hit during the pandemic. Students and adult children returning to the family home could potentially increase housing supply, for example. Um, and the relative lack of international migrants in the country um, at the moment, and people also working on temporary visas in Australia, also tends to increase the supply of um, rental housing. So rising vacancies and downward pressure on rents could end up increasing the supply of dwellings for sale, either to uh, investors or to potential homeowners. So there would seem to be an opportunity in both countries, in Canada and Australia, to put the not-for-profit sector into a position uh, in which it can take advantage of that potential supply dividend. However, in Australia, the economic stimulus measures announced so far have really disappointed these commentators who have called for more public house building um, or for policies that allow further expansion of the not-for-profit sector. In fact, the very careful sort of politicking um, around private rental sector policies recently actually reveals how finely balanced these competing interests actually are in Australia. But I think that the tone of most Australian housing policy commentators so far is that the supports put in place um, have really been more clearly aimed at supporting landlord and developer interests than tenants' interests so far. I think that's highlighted in Chris Martin's video some weeks ago as well, that imbalance. So on new build supply itself, um, the videos and various comments made by the panels uh, from each of the three countries, I think have been actually surprisingly upbeat. Um, so we know from um, very recent interviews that we've been doing in Australia with developers that the industry has been quite resilient so far. Um, so social distancing requirements on site have been the trickiest issue um, to navigate for developers. And things like labour and skill shortages uh, were actually a problem in some parts of the construction industry before COVID-19 hit. Um, and it could be a barrier uh, to using the construction sector, the construction industry to roll out a, a larger stimulus package, uh, if that's what's intended. But I think now there are real doubts about whether this will actually happen, at least in Australia at the moment. So for example, the home builder policy here is very much aimed at moderate income households rather than those on low incomes or people living on the, on the margins of home ownership or aspiring to get into home ownership. Um, and so the policy is really designed to keep you know, the flow of work going to builders and contractors, uh, but it's not really designed to boost housing supply more generally. 
Um, in Australia, there's quite a lot of talk about sites slowing down um, and construction work beginning to run out, perhaps towards the end of this year. I noted from uh, David Graham's video that this is also uh, potentially an issue in Canada with productivity down up to 30% uh, and now some development sites uh, stalling or being mothballed there. Um, but it's interesting also, I think, that uh, in neither country has the planning process really been put forward as a, as a barrier to increasing housing supply should the construction sector be used for that economic stimulus purpose. And that's uh, interesting, it's also refreshing, um, but it's quite unusual when we think about past debates about housing supply and housing affordability, where uh, you know, planning has been quite central to those debates uh, and put forward quite often in housing economics as, as a, a, an impediment to achieving more affordable housing systems. Um, but there has been a lot of uh, reference to the problematic nature of the land market itself in previous videos and indeed it, this has uh, arisen in discussion in some of the breakout groups that I've been in, involved in too. So uh, Philip Barnes from Barrett Developments in the UK uh, made a comment uh, in his video session recently um, referring to the need actually to create more sales outlets in the UK and that's a direct result of having slower construction operations on each site. Um, so in other words, if each site is producing uh, fewer uh, units in, in a given time period, then uh, to achieve national targets, quite simply, more sites are required, um, e each of which with a lower, lower output level. There's also been quite a lot of suggestions in our debates and videos about the need for low cost uh, or even subsidised public sector land transfers. I think that's actually arisen in all three countries as an idea that might help the not-for-profit sector to uh, increase housing supply and then contribute to the economic stimulus efforts as well. And then just in concluding then finally some, some thoughts for me about um, you know, the policy opportunities presented by the crisis itself. Um, so in my view, early in the COVID-19 crisis, there was a view um, that some unfinished construction projects uh, and perhaps even some privately owned investments could become distressed assets quite easily if housing prices, if housing rents and vacancies were badly affected. Um, but now this actually seems to me less likely to happen. And so far the evidence about falling prices and rents isn't really all that dramatic. Um, I think there is a question about how indebted private landlords really are in Australia. Um, and it's worth asking the question whether the crisis we're in might actually simply accelerate the polarisation and wealth and ownership that we were actually seeing before the crisis. Um, in terms of new builds, uh, sector and land markets, I'm actually not very optimistic. Um, we know from previous studies of land markets that interventions that are designed to alter land prices actually take many years to feed through the system. Uh, we also know that owners are happy to withhold land from the market for decades, if need be, until the right conditions uh, arrive, the right market conditions. Um, and private developers uh, in UK, Canada and Australia are actually saying now that more land's needed, you know, because of that uh, argument that the capacity of each site is less than before the crisis. Um, so, in a sense, the competition for land may be higher. Uh, and of course, not-for-profit sector developers in Australia and Canada will then struggle to access land at prices which are suitable for affordable housing in the face of that competition. So that's all for me, really, just some uh, thoughts to help get the discussion going. And I look forward to participating in due course.